So our objectives today is we want you to be able to gain some knowledge about the needs of individuals with mental health challenges. We also want you to understand how to best um, provide employment supports for individuals with mental health challenges. We're also hoping that you learn how to assist those with mental health challenges in setting their goals and developing long-term supports. We also want you to learn about programs and resources for coping for people coping with mental health challenges. So those are our objectives for today. So Terry, this was the first poll question. Um, we'd like to um, see what your role is um, from our audience out there. So if you would take a few seconds just to quickly answer that, we'd greatly appreciate it. See a lot of vocational rehabilitation counselors, workforce, education, some others. If any of you that are typing in other, if you want to put in the chat box um, what you do, be something that we can go back and look at. Well, again, as we're waiting uh, for the polling to end, just a reminder, we'll take questions at the end of the presentation today. So um, as Heidi had mentioned, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box and we'll make sure that we leave time at the end of the session today to be able to answer those questions. And we can probably, Terry, if you want to, we can probably end the poll. Yeah, we're just getting a, a little bit fewer responses than we were before. So I was going to okay. suggest that we'll end the poll. Okay, it looks about almost 80% of, of you are um, vocational rehabilitation. So glad hopefully you'll, we'll be able to uh, find this information useful. Terry, if you could close out the poll. Try the, try the the oh, he's letting them see it. Okay. He's sharing the results so everybody can see it. Okay, is it is it gone down gone down now? Uh, it's still up on our screen, so go ahead and hit the exit the top. Right okay. Right. okay. Okay, I was able to close it out. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Kimberly. Oh, you're welcome. So today we wanted to define a few things. Um, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of uh, words that are used um, in multiple things. So we wanted to be clear as to what we were talking about today in our, in our presentation. So sub SUDs or substance use disorders, um, that is going to be the use of any type of alcohol or drugs. Um, and it's going to be that excessive use of that. So anything from your cannabis to your alcohol to your opioids. Um, serious mental illness, so the difference between an SMI and an SED, which is serious emotional disturbance, is, is age. So your serious mental illness is going to apply to your adults that are 18 and over. Your serious emotional disturbance is going to apply to your youth, um, those that are under the age of 18. All of them are going to have some sort of serious um, impact in a person's daily living. Um, they're functioning. Um, and that's, that's how they're going to fall into these categories. You're, those of you that were in education, you're going to see a lot of your serious emotional disturbance in your IEPs or on your RRs. Um, it's a pretty much a catch-all category. Um, and a lot of your um, different uh, disorders, such as your childhood schizophrenia, um, your pervasive developmental disorders, things like that, they're all going to fall up under emotional disturbance at that age. Um, co-occurring. So you're going to hear us either call co-occurring or comorbid today. Um, and when, we, when we're talking about that, we're, all, we're talking about the person that's been diagnosed with a mental health disorder and also substance abuse. That can sometimes also be referred to as dual diagnosed, um, but today we are going to be referring to dual diagnosed as somebody with a mental health disorder and intellectual disabilities. And first we're going to be talking about transition age youth and I'm going to be talking first about resources and we're going to dig a little deeper into uh, the challenges that uh, youth we're talking about individuals typically from age 14 to 26 that's how the mental health system typically defines that age range uh, <clears throat> excuse me but I know that falls within the transition age youth or age range for 
individuals in the VR system as well, although ours goes a little bit higher on the um, adult side. So first we're gonna be talking about the Youth Technical Assistance Center. So the Youth Technical Assistance Center is a, an organization much like PE3 that is funded by the Rehabilitation Services Administration. And their primary focus is working with individuals, youth with many different challenges, such as uh, the criminal justice system, such as being homeless, such as um, single and pregnant, such as out of school. And in many cases, uh, they develop different documents, different toolkits, bulletins, white papers, regards to, you know, what are the challenges that these individuals face that lead to them having these, these situations such as homelessness, such as a criminal justice system. So anywhere from trauma informed to mental health, the challenges that individuals face with mental health or substance, or excuse me, um, significant emotional disturbance as well. So this is a great resource that I recommend we also have it in the resource page, the link to the YTAC uh, in regards to a tool that you can use to help you enhance your abilities, enhance your skill set, and your knowledge of working with this population. Also, think college. Now, it's typically listed for individuals that are intellectual have intellectual disabilities in that um, individuals with intellectual disabilities and their families, have you thought about college? Can you think college? But I recommend this as well for individuals that are duly diagnosed, as Kimberly had mentioned before, those with ID and with mental illness, because I think that post-secondary education is a good landing place for many individuals, not everybody, but for many individuals in regards to continuing to build their skill set or their career path for their, their being able to forge themselves forward in independence. And lastly, I have list of the Youth Leadership Network. Now, it might not necessarily be called that in your state, but typically states do have these programs. And it, specifically, I'll dial in on the Pennsylvania one for a point of reference, the Pennsylvania Youth Leadership Network. And what its premise is to do is to put youth with disabilities, with older youth with disabilities, acting as mentors to help them learn independent skills, help them learn advocacy skills, help them learn how to make the most of opportunities that to present it with. So again, these are tools I think that you as the professional can use to help individuals that you're serving, youth with disabilities, youth specifically with mental illness, uh, and being able to get them resources, get yourself resources to help them foster independence, develop their pre-vocational skills and eventually their vocational skills. Next slide, please. And specifically, supports to youth. We're going to talk about some programs. We talked about some resources. Now we're going to talk a little bit lower level about some, some programs that are available for individuals with SED or SMI. Um, first episode psychosis, also known as FEP. Now, we have a diagram that we'll show in the next slide, but I want to go into a little bit of what the, the FEP program is designed for. It's pretty much straightforward person had their first a psychotic break, their first episode of psychosis. This program, Peace being one of them, a program of Horizon House, which is in Philadelphia, PA, they are national programs. They're funded by um, uh, medical assistance. Um, first episode of psychosis is a program that helps individuals from being hospitalized for the first time. So there are programs out there called ACT. We're not gonna get into that today per se, but it has a very similar premise. It's called the Assertive uh, Community Treatment Program, and it's designed to develop a circle support to help an individual with mental illness, serious mental illness, to be able to remain in the community, not be hospitalized. So we'll talk about the tenets of that in our next slide, but I wanted to throw it out there as a program for consideration. We have families together in New York State listed Family peer is a very important role, I think, as well. We'll talk more about a certified peer and a certified recovery specialist, which are peer positions, individuals that are in recovery themselves, acting as professional alongside the individual. Family peer is helping families with a loved one, an individual who has mental illness, in many cases youth, uh, 17 and under, helping the family learn how to be a resource, how to advocate for that individual, how to be a support. Because in many cases, families may actually be a detriment to the individual with mental illness. They may have uh, trauma in the family. Then individuals, family members themselves may struggle with mental illness, may struggle with substance abuse issues, may struggle with a variety of different things. The family peer 
is a family member who's had an individual in their own life, in their own family, who's had mental illness, and they've learned how to advocate for the person, how to help the person have a voice, help the person learn how to focus on being independent and understanding their disability so that they can be better for it. Uh, and I'm going to turn the youth mental health first aid over to Kimberly. So as I said earlier, I am a youth mental health first aid instructor, and this is very similar to your traditional CPR course for first aid. Um, it basically teaches you how to identify, understand, and um, to respond to the signs of a youth that may be um, having um, a mental health crisis or substance abuse, substance use issues. Um, it teaches you how to identify that early and how to intervene with that. Um, it is geared for adults, so you have to be 18 to be able to take the course, but the curriculum is based on um, looking at youth that are um, 6 to 18 years old. Um, so um, it just helps you to be able to identify those first signs and it teaches you how to intervene and how to get them to the appropriate help. And just a side note, um, in the state of Pennsylvania, again, Kimberly and I both being from Pennsylvania, we're going to be talking about some resources we're familiar with, but our state Department of Corrections, basically the state prisons um, in 2016 and 2018 had each and every staff member, 16,000 people, take the adult mental health first aid because they saw that as an important component in being able to address mental health issues because there's such a high population in the criminal justice system. And it's a great tool, I think, for any professional working with individuals who may be disadvantaged, um, maybe have involvement in the criminal justice system. So I just wanted to emphasize what Kimberly is saying. It's, it's, it's a great training if you can get into it. I strongly recommend it. I know that it really enhanced Kimberly's skills. And it's something that is going to help you, not just with youth, but with adults as well. And in many cases, um, when a person struggles with mental illness, it may be a lifelong disability. So being able to have those first aid skills and knowing how to see the signs and help people where they're at is so critical. Nextly schools, uh, sorry, did you want to say anything else? Okay. Nextly schools, uh, making sure that the schools are tuned in to providing mental health services is critical. And in many cases, the schools are there because they're being tasked to do so many things with individuals these days. And uh, one method or one program that I'm familiar with, that I recommend if, if you don't have it in your area, seek to see if you can get it put into your area where the local managed care organization, now for those folks that aren't familiar with the mental health system, a managed care organization is that entity that provides basically the purse strings for mental health services in the community. Uh, what a local managed care organization had done in the five county region in central Pennsylvania around the capital, Harrisburg, PA, was put clinics, mental health clinics, in the school facilities. So the 239 um, physical locations of the schools, whether it be the primary schools, the uh, high schools, those types of middle schools, every school in this area has a mental health clinic in the school. That is so powerful and so being able to meet the needs of the individual where they're at, as opposed to saying, well, here's, here's a referral, go see XYZ community service provider. No, the community service providers are in the schools. So again, if your school doesn't already have a program like that, please see what they can do to be able to get that in their, their, um, in their, their menu of services because it is so critical and so helpful. Because uh, as we know, especially in uh, secondary schools, high schools, Many individuals experience their first mental illness um, in their teens and into their 20s. So having those resources available is critical. And lastly, colleges, as you probably know, many colleges have their disability services offices on campus. But as things have been challenging moving forward in this, this world that we live in right now, a lot of things are, have gone virtual being able to make sure that colleges are still able to function and provide those mental health services despite the situation, despite the, the online versus in person is critical. So if you don't already have your contacts with your schools in regards to what they're doing for mental health services, please reach out to them, find out well, in this new environment, this new world we currently have because of COVID, 
what are you doing to make sure that students are getting the mental health services they need while they're attending online? So that's very important. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we have here is the diagram of the FEP, the first episode psychosis program. So we'll start at the top 12 noon of, of the diagram and move around. And uh, the first one we have is individual therapy. We have a picture of a person with gears turning in their head. So it's so critical for when a person has their first episode psychosis to have that therapy that meets the needs of where they're at. So that's the first part of that wheel. And moving uh, clockwise to the right, we have family therapy. And again, as I mentioned earlier, having family peers as a resource, having families understand what's going on in their loved one's life, find, finding out what is going on in the dynamic of the family. There may be some issues that are exacerbating the mental illness as opposed to helping that. So having the families be in therapy as well to meet the needs of the individual is so critical. Next, psychoeducation helping the individual understand what's going on in their life, helping their family understand what's going on in the life of the loved one is so critical. So psychoeducation in helping understand it's not your fault, this is what's going on. It could be a chemical imbalance, it could be some uh, family dynamics, it could be you know, trauma that, that they've experienced. So helping them understand themselves is critical as well. And the next one, very importantly, supported education and employment. And again, depending upon the needs of the individual, the uh, abilities of the individual, it could be a supported employment scenario where they, they graduate from school, they don't want anything further, they've dropped out of school, they don't have their GED, they just need support getting that first job or getting a job to provide them independence. That's one level of support, but also supported education because maybe the person did graduate, maybe they graduate at the top of their class, now that they're away from home and they're in the college setting, that's when uh, the, the family support is gone. Now the individual is starting to see the effects of mental illness and the support isn't there. So being able to support a person in the post-secondary education realm is so critical as well. And we'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next one down, nursing and occupational therapy support. So again, making sure that nursing nurses are available to check in on the medication. Now, again, this is a team that is talking with one another amongst themselves, so it isn't like they're independent of one another, but it's a team, that's why the circle is there. So nurse, nursing, helping with the medication, we'll get to the medication in a moment, but making sure that the person is doing well uh, from a medical perspective, and that if there's any need to change medication, there's a professional that's involved in the team. And a side note, there is a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist that's overseeing this whole team. So is it something that's independent from a, a higher level therapist? So they're overseeing this whole team, making sure that all the parts are working together in unison to the individual that's in the middle. Next, the peer support. We'll talk more about the peer and recovery specialist in a moment, but having that person that has lived that life, that is um, walking the walk that the individual's had. Hey, I had this issue happen to me when I was in college. Do you know what was going on? Would have been great to have somebody support me. That peer can be very critical in terms of providing organic connection to that individual. Um, social groups, again, making sure the person doesn't clock out in society and making sure that they, they develop their social skills is also an important component of the success of this team and the individual. Lastly, medication. I don't want to say too much on that, but we know that um, making sure that the medication is doing well, that it's managed well, that the individual is not having ill effects because of the medication and is doing what it's supposed to. So having that team of support is really critical. And we'll talk more about statistics on supported education, excuse me, supported employment uh, a few slides from now, but you'll see this is why the statistics for supported employment are so high in terms of the, the positive outcomes. So we'll talk about that in a few slides from now. Next slide. Uh, supported employment. <clears throat> There is the traditional way of supported employment, which most VR professionals are familiar with, and that's the training place. Basically, the individual is assessed, the individual gets receives training, pre-vocational types of services, and then they're put in the work setting. Whereas the um, mental health version of supported employment that has shown great success is called the individual placement and support. It's from the mid-90s from Dartmouth College, and it's also known as IPS. And what it does is it's placed and trained. So, and that might 
concern some folks that might concern, well, we don't want to burn bridges with businesses of the employers because we're getting people into these jobs that don't have training. No, it's been shown that this is around 59 to 60% successful versus the 23 to 24% traditional supported employment if it's done properly. So making sure that there's a collaboration with the mental health agency, both at the state and local level, is critical to making sure that the IPS model uh, is working well. There's a fidelity tool, which basically at the end of the year, you report out, okay, did this agency do X, Y, Z? And that is a good guide as to whether they're doing it properly or not. So there's a tool involved, there's a fidelity tool, making sure that uh, the service is provided. And what I have listed here is the IPS Supported Employment, a practical guide. Um, it's a document you'll find on the IPS website. So it's a resource, the IPS website is a link that's a resource in the end of our presentation. I recommend if you wanna find out what this model <coughs> of supported employment is and how it's different from um, your traditional employment, I, I highly recommend it. And lastly, SAMHSA, um, the federal funding source, much like RSA is a federal funding source for supported, or uh, VR, SAMHSA is the uh, federal funding source for all things mental health. Um, they endorse this. They have a toolkit. It's called the IPS Toolkit, Supported uh, Employment Toolkit. They endorse this as the best method for providing supported employment for persons with mental illness. I know, Kimberly, you want to say a few things? Yeah, so one of the things that um, we need to be looking at with uh, people with mental health is collaboration. Um, it's, it's huge. It's, this is not the responsibility of just one agency. It's going to take all of us together. So some of those um, state and local resources that you can look at is looking at your state mental health um, agencies, um, which Rain is working for, and he, he's an employment first lead for them. Um, state VR agencies, um, and obviously a lot of you are working VR out there, whether you're working state or possibly federal. Um, so looking to collaborate with those agencies. Here in Pennsylvania, we call them career links, um, but they're the one stops. Um, your American job centers, like looking to, to um, collaborate with them um, within workforce. Um, employment first agencies, um, Randy does it statewide. Um, there's also local employment first um, groups that get together. Um, so looking for looking at those in your, in your local area. Um, looking at your ID agencies, um, that's another huge collaboration and those are those can be your county level and those can also be um, your state um, offices here we call it office of developmental programs odp um, locally it may be called something else in your area but looking to collaborate with all of those different agencies can be very helpful in, in working with people with mental health and intellectual disabilities before before we move on i'm sorry i just want to say one last thing in regards to as I mentioned before, I was on the Isle of VR, the side of VR, um, for 16 years. And even before that, with job coaching and whatnot, my funding for the agency I was um, working in was purely VR. When I got to mental health, I started to see things differently. And it, it was a good transition for me in regards to helping to understand where the funding is. <clears throat> and one thing I found to try and untangle the confusion of well, why isn't the mental health agency able to pay for uh, vocational services? And we'll talk more about what states have done to kind of get around that. So we'll give you some examples near the end. Pennsylvania isn't quite there yet, so uh, working, definitely working on trying to uh, figure out ways that we can do that. But in many cases, um, many states have the mental health services supported employment services paid for at the county local level. And that's why I have that listed there. So what happens is their base service dollars, their, their county block grant dollars that they receive, the counties are paying for these services. So the, the only challenge with that moving forward is each county kind of does things its, its own way. In Pennsylvania, we have 60, 48 different joiners. So there's some that are just one county, some are multiple counties together. So we have 48 different ways that supported employment is done and supported funding wise for mental health in Pennsylvania. So it makes it kind of challenging in regards to having uh, a consistent pattern of how we do things. So, but it's what we have is what we're working with. So my intent, my, my interest is to work with the county agencies to help them 
look at how can they refine their IPS, their, their um, SAMHSA toolkit supported, supported and plan. So it varies from state to state. Get to know what your state mental health system does. Get to know where they're paying for uh, supported employment services and get plugged in with those organizations, whether it be the state itself or the county. Next slide. And supported education. Again, I think it's two sides of a similar coin in regards to many individuals may need the path of supportive employment to help them be successful for those individuals with mental illness. But I think many, many individuals would benefit from good supportive education resources made available to them. Now, one model that I'm listing here is the clubhouse model, and it's based off the fountain house model from New York City from the 1940s. And currently, the National Center for Clubhouse Development, the one uh, icon that I have listed here, is international. And they have clubhouses in more than 20 different countries. So it's an international model. But in uh, the United States, it's not in every state, but it is in very many states. It's in Pennsylvania, for example. It's in Massachusetts. It's in Minnesota, uh, to name a few. But the clubhouse model has, is twofold. It does have supported education, but it also has supported employment. And the supported employment model is what's called the work order day. So the individuals come in, they're clubhouse members. So it's a place, it's a safe place in the community to help them build their social skills, but also develop work hardening skills. And that's one side of the house, but the other side of the house is for those individuals that say, I would like to go to post-secondary education. I would like to get my GED, for example. The Clubhouse model provides supportive education resources to help the individuals be successful. And I have the word importance listed there because I can't express enough the importance for supportive education and for the need for not just VR, but the uh, mental health agencies, state agencies to be able to support this. And the reason I state this, for example, just to give a backdrop, uh, in Pennsylvania, just one state of, of many, there are about over 660,000 individuals with mental illness who are receiving Medicaid benefits in Pennsylvania. Now, if you think about that, the state VR agency, they serve about uh, 85,000 individuals annually. So the, the capacity just isn't in there, isn't there for the VR system to serve the number, the sheer number of individuals with mental illness who could potentially be working. And I'm convinced, again, this is more of an anecdotal type of thing, but I'm convinced being professional in uh, VR for 30 years, that many, many individuals are going to the job centers, the American job centers, the um, one stops to look for work. They have the ability to get the job, you know, they present well, they're able to do it, but when the stressors of work hit on top of their existing mental illness, they lose the job. So I think that uh, in regards to supported employment, it's a critical thing to help individuals, but also supported education. And the reason I, I bring that up is because many individuals are looking for uh, work that is beneath their ability, and that's part of the reason they're not being successful. And the reason they weren't successful in that is they went to school, mental illness kicked in, they dropped out of school, and they're saying, I don't want to go that path. I think we need to say, what can we do to help these individuals to be successful in the post-secondary schooling so that they're getting the schooling that they're desiring. They're getting the types of work that they're desiring. They're getting the skills that they need to get those jobs. And then by having the support continue, they're able to be successful and not lose that job. And also be satisfied with the job because they have the degree, they have the skills of their, their capabilities. So I think collaboration with post-secondary institutions is critical as well. That's the last thing I'll say on this. Uh, as we know, most universities, most post-secondary schools have um, a disability services department or individual, depending on the size of the facility, uh, that helps these individuals with mental illness. Um, what I'm hoping to do, we're, we're looking at a, a pilot, uh, not sure how far we're going to go with it. It's just in the Genesis stage at this time, no pun intended because of Genesis Club. But um, we're looking at 
getting, as I mentioned a few slides ago, getting clinics on community college campuses so that individuals have mental health services where they're at, as opposed to going to community college, having a mental illness, struggling because maybe they're not developing relationships with individuals, because it's a totally different world, I think, in community college versus like the university setting where a person is, is uh, on campus house or whatnot. Anyhow, what we'd like to do is put these clinics in these community colleges so that individuals are getting services and served by the community providers at the school. So I think short out supportive education is something we all need to look at doing for those with mental illness. And lastly, I have the higher education uh, support toolkit, which is from Boston University. Again, can't recommend it enough. It's a resource that's referenced in the resource section. Print it off. Pull it up as a PDF, whatever, look at it. It's a great document in regards to helping a person develop like a, an education wrap, shall we say, um, to be able to help them develop their uh, tools that are they're comfortable with to be successful in school. Now, it's something that they partially fill out themselves. What are the needs? What do they think would be helpful for them to be successful? But it puts it on paper. And then a professional assistant works with them and they work through, well, how can we accomplish these things? Great tool, I recommend it highly. You know, if you know individuals are uh, going off to school that have identified mental illness, I would say sit down with the individual, have them fill this out, and then review it with them before they go off to school. Next slide. Comorbid, as Kimberly had mentioned, um, there's co-occurring, which is more the medical model. So um, it's typically found in the cases where there's medical assistance, tr medical assisted treatment, MAT, <clears throat> where the individuals have like Suboxone or some similar drug to help them off of opioids. So that's usually the co-occurring. The comorbid is more in the therapeutic realm. So we have comorbid listed here. And again, we want to identify its mental health and substance abuse. And the reason why we have this slide here is we're asking, is it the chicken or the egg? Is the mental health more important? Is the substance abuse more important? Which is the higher priority? The answer is both. So whether the mental illness started at an early age or the substance abuse started at an early age, they started drinking at eight and they found out that they had bipolar at 15, um, <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't matter which started first, they both need dealt with equally. You can't try and weigh up, you know, you have a scale that's unbalanced. You gotta balance the scales out and you have to work both simultaneously and see that, whatever um, uh, resources you're sending them to, any, any therapist or whatnot that you might be funding or that the mental health services might be funding, but they're dealing with both equally. Next slide, please. Dual diagnosis, uh, Kimberly and I are gonna share this together. Um, the dual diagnosis, again, is are those individuals are with intellectual disabilities and um, substance, not substance abuse, excuse me, mental illness. So I'll let Kimberly really talk about the first bullet and then I'll finish up. So again, we were talking about um, dual diagnosis, it being um, mental health and intellectual disabilities, um, which is how we've diagnosed it here. Um, so collaborating with those agencies is crucial when you're working with somebody for employment. Um, looking at your, uh, most of your, I know it's here um, in Pennsylvania, our intellectual disabilities are county um, county, level. county level, and like um, Randy was saying earlier, some of them are co-joined, so some of them are multiple. We have 48 across the state. So hooking up with those, finding out who your, your local county level intellectual disabilities is, um, and then also looking at um, who your, your, is at your state level. Um, like I said here, it's Office of Developmental Programs, at ODP, mm -hmm. so looking to see which organization is at the state level in, in your local area and making sure that you're collaborating with them. It can be, it can be huge in, in helping this population. Right, and in many cases, there may be funding available for those individuals that uh, the mental health system may not be able to provide. Through waivers. Through waivers, yes, through waivers, through human, excuse me, home and community-based services waiver. Um, and also maybe, base funds. And base funds, yes. Mm -hmm. So, and also too, uh, in many cases, because the individuals have dual diagnosis, much like comorbid, co-occurring, um, since the individual has both, there's more agencies that are probably working on behalf of the individual. I know in our own state, and I'm sure it's, it's like that in many states, 
the State Office of Mental Health, my, my agency, and the Intellectual Disabilities Office work together collaboratively. And they have different, <coughs> um, they actually have a conference, they have different uh, learning sessions where we can learn about, okay, what are the specific needs of a person who has, presents with these, these multiple issues? So again, looking to your mental health agency, looking to your ID agency, uh, as well as at the local level is critical to being able to know, okay, what are resources are available to help the individuals that we serve. Another organization I'm gonna mention, just like I mentioned with uh, the, the YTAC and the uh, Youth Leadership Networks, Pennsylvania Youth Leadership Network earlier, is the Statewide Employment Leadership Network. Now, it's not something that is similar to like the WINTAC or the YTAC or the NTAC, the Technical Assistance Agencies or the PE3 um, who we're uh, going through right now. It's not funded the same way. Uh, it's not funded at the federal level, but what state ID agencies do is they pay a fee to the Statewide Employment Leadership Network annually to receive resources, to receive technical assistance, much like the different RSA technical assistance facilities provide on all things employment. So again, if you're not familiar with the Statewide Employment Leadership Network, I recommend going to that website and finding out what kind of resources they have available. You know, if, you're, if you have a population that you're working with that are dual diagnosed, I strongly suggest that you look at the Statewide Employment Leadership Network as a resource, as a tool uh, to help you in regards to what are the challenges, what are the resources that are available for uh, supportive employment. And again, I'm gonna reiterate about the Youth Leadership Network. Again, individuals that are in this situation may greatly benefit from the Youth Leadership Network, say that 10 times real fast, in regards to advocacy, in regards to support, in regards to learning leadership skills. So again, I recommend those two organizations to be able to provide technical assistance both to yourself as a professional and to the individual as the um, individual you're working with. Next slide, please. So Veterans Administration, um, that is a federally funded service um, uh, for veterans with mental health. Um, one of the biggest resources that they have is their Veterans Readiness and Employment, which is VRNE, um, to help people with uh, mental health um, get back to work. That's a, that's a special program. Basically, that's the federal funded part of the, the state VR. Um, it's the same agency, but just the federal part of it. We are going to go more in depth in this this afternoon because we are doing a presentation on the veterans' mental health. Um, but we wanted to, to bring this into here because veterans mental health is, is huge and those of you that are supporting them. Um, one of the big services that's a really great service for them is the, the veterans um, peer support services. So this is basically somebody that has, just like the regular peer support, it's somebody that has that lived experience that can walk alongside of that veteran and help them through those services. Um, they can help them with goal setting. It can help them um, identifying their strengths, um, supports and resources, um, looking at things in the community to, to be able to help them. Um, it's huge when, the, when these men and women are coming out of the service to be able to transition from that um, military life into that civilian life um, and the trauma and everything that they've been through. And like I said, we'll get really in depth into this this afternoon, um, but that VA, peer support is, is critical for them. You mind if I say a few things as well? Uh, I was thinking this Kimberly was talking, this is something we hadn't scripted, but um, I think it's important nonetheless, there are 145 VA hospitals across the, the United States, which is a, a large number, and every one of them has VA peer support services. And it's something that, again, it's, we'll talk about the details of it in a little bit here, but it's something that's a very organic thing. And if you're talking with veterans, if, you, if your population is, is veterans that you're serving, find out if they have a VA peer uh, in their life. And if not, find out what they can do, help them to find out what they can do to uh, be able to get that peer in their life. And one last thought uh, in regards to this is um, what's called the Memphis Model Crisis Intervention Training, or CIT for short. Uh, it's a, something similar to the Mental Health First Aid. It's a week-long training 
that professionals, typically first responders, and many of them are veterans, you know, firefighters, uh, police officers, EMT. This is a great training for them to take as well in regards to how do you deal with an individual who presents having mental illness? You know, they might roll up on a scene and maybe it's domestic violence or maybe it's, it's uh, they, the person crashed because they were driving down the middle of the road because they thought they were in another country and they were avoiding IEDs. Um, so they, they crash and they cause an accident. The CIT training helps individuals to be able to, professionals be able to address, okay, the person might be presenting with mental illness, but also too, they've added a component. Okay, this person might be a veteran who's just returned and they have some mental illness. How do we resolve the issue? How do we help them um, come back to sense of reality? How do we help them you know, not do anything violent against them or have any, them do something violent against others? It's a great program. Again, Memphis Model CIT. It's not listed in our resources, but we'll see that we get that information out to you. Uh, sorry, Tim. So criminal justice, this is another um, big area where you're going to see a lot of mental health is in the population. Um, it's either in, in jail, prison, or, or even in a federal prison. So statistically, about 64% in jail um, have a mental health diagnosis. About 54% of those that are in prison have a mental health diagnosis and about 45% in our federal prisons. And if I could just pause you for just a moment, I'm sorry. Uh, just for clarification, jail is, is your local, your county, county. county lockup. Prison is typically your state lockup and then um, federal prison, as Kimberly mentioned. So just for the clarification, so uh, they are separate systems. They do all meld into one, but just for the sake of, of understanding, Kimberly was talking about county, state, and then federal. Um, so in your resources, there's a link to a um, white paper that was done um, by the um, Department of Justice. The actual statistics and everything was pulled from 2011 to 2012, but the report was actually finalized in June of 2017. So it's a fairly recent um, research that was done. Um, it was actually based on self-reporting, and I found it very, very interesting because in one in seven in a state or federal prison self-reported that they had um, a mental health diagnosis, and about one in four jail inmates in jail had um, reported that they had um, a mental health disorder. So it's just kind of interesting to see how what we see as an actual diagnosis versus what they see, um, how it's so much lower. Um, and I have actually seen that when I've been in, in the um, state jails here, the correction centers, um, that they, they don't see themselves as having a mental health diagnosis. So trying to get them to talk about that and, and acknowledge that mental health sometimes can be kind of hard, um, which then of course impacts their ability to work because they're in denial of that mental health. And so trying to get them to overcome that and, and accept that and, and be able to work with it so that they can overcome it and, and be able to be employed. And it doesn't hinder them and cause, cause them problems. Um, people that have substance use disorders that are in jail is very, very high. Um, and so again, going back to that co-occurring or co-morbid, um, there's, a, there's a lot of, of our prisoners and our um, our guys that are in jail or in prison that are dual diagnosed. And it, it's a huge burden on our, on our prison system um, when we have to house, house these people um, because they're doing things that they shouldn't do because of their mental health or because of their substance use um, and they get themselves into trouble. But if I can too, just a side note, um, statistically over 50%, I think it's like 52 to 54% of individuals who are arrested are under the influence. So it speaks very much, that statistic speaks very much to the intersect of substance abuse and incarceration and the path that it leads towards to get people, individuals caught up into that system. So that's one thing we wanna keep in mind as well. 
is that you know if you're working with individuals that have a criminal record, there's likely more than likely a mental health diagnosis and statistically a substance abuse uh, diagnosis as well. So I'm sure it's something folks are already aware of, but we wanted to, to lay out the, the statistics so you get an understanding um, from, from a, a uh, data perspective. So, and again, um, in, in the criminal justice system, uh, traumatic brain injuries is, is rampant. Um, there's, it's just, the, the statistics are anywhere between about 25 to 87%, um, which is very, very high. Some of it is self-reported. Um, a lot of these times, these guys have had brain injuries as children prior to coming into the, into the criminal justice system. Um, and so then a lot of times, due to socioeconomic stuff, they may or may not have been, ever been treated. So there may not be any medical records. So sometimes it is self-reported, which is why there's such a discrepancy in, in the numbers we can't like pinpoint it because a lot of times there isn't that record and we're just going on what they have said um, from the traumatic brain injury that they've had. Well, I do you think too, Kimberly, it might be, you think that the institutions, jails, prisons, whatever, maybe they look at how you diagnose that disability differently. So maybe the statistics are off because of, of how they're, you know, one facility might, might diagnose it this way as a mental illness. Depending on what they're using to, sure. to diagnose it, sure. you know, what, what assessments they may, or tools that they may be using to diagnose it could be different from one facility to the next. So there's a lot of different variances in there. So that's kind of why the number is so broad, um, but it, it, there is, it's significant. Um, if anybody's interested in trying to look, um, there was a 2018 study actually done here in Pennsylvania on um, our prison systems and um, some guys that volunteered um, to be part of that research on traumatic brain injury. So it was some very interesting statistics that came out of that. And I mentioned before we were going to get to certified peer and recovery specialist, certified recovery specialist. The history of it is back in the early 2000s, there was a White House white paper talking about redesigning, reinventing the mental health system. And part of that reorganization, that reinventing of the mental health system was the creation of the certified peer. And uh, since then, the recovery specialist has come along as well. But what it is is, I think there's about 31 states right now that have Medicaid funded certified peer specialists. And in some cases, many states, they, they are both a peer and recovery specialist in one. In Pennsylvania, for example, the certified peer in mental health, the certified recovery specialist, the substance abuse are two separate professionals, but there are many individuals that I'm aware, personally aware, that hold both certifications. So the history was, need to reinvent the system, need to get more down to local level. The answer was the certified peer, the certified recovery specialist. So it's an individual, it's an organic thing, it's lived life. It's an individual who has had mental illness in their history, has had substance abuse in their history. They are in a good place in recovery. They're well enough now that they can take that role in this professional and talk about it to other people to be able to be that person to come alongside that individual. Now, they're not a case manager, they're not a counselor. They're just helping them in their process of recovery. So it's a low level paraprofessional, but it's still a, a critical needed, needed service nonetheless. But um, individuals that are receiving peer services are much better off in their recovery process. And it's a multi-use uh, service. There's the youth peer, there's forensic criminal justice peer, there's a veteran peer, there's older adult peer. Currently right now in Pennsylvania, we're doing the LGBTQ peer. They're developing that, that um, uh, subset of the certified peer. So it's something that's very become very wide and it's something that's very, very um, effective in helping the lives of individuals who are living with mental illness, helping them recover, helping them stay in recovery. If you're not familiar with the program, Find out if your state is providing certified peer services or recovery services to help individuals in their path of recovery. And when you're working with individuals, if they're receiving uh, medical assistance, and, and in some cases, we talked earlier about how counties are using block grant funds or base funds to pay for services. In Pennsylvania, the recovery specialist, it's not something that's Medicaid available because it's a distinct position from a certified peer. 
but the counties are paying for it. So find out if the individual is receiving peer services, are they receiving recovery specialists, if you find out that they have these, these disabilities. If not, find out if you can get them plugged into these services because again, any extra services that can support this individual in uh, their recovery process, whether it be mental health or substance abuse, is so critical. It's so important to help them be independent and be successful and, and stay in that place of recovery. I highly recommend uh, making sure that the, the individual, uh, I can't state enough, that the individual isn't receiving peer services. If your, if your state, if your county pays for it, if your state pays for it, get them plugged into those services if they're not already listed as a service in their life. Next slide. And funding and long-term supports. Big question th people have in regards to, well, how do we pay for this? Uh, one way of bringing funding, which you probably know about, um, Again, we didn't talk about this per se, but Kim and I, with a few minutes we have remaining, we can talk quickly about that. Um, in 2017, uh, the Pennsylvania Mental Health Agency gave the Pennsylvania VR Agency $50,000 as a state match for the Pennsylvania VR Agency to draw down federal VR dollars. So what happened was, when we gave the VR Agency $50,000, it allowed the state VR agency to draw down over $180,000, and it turned out to approximately $235,000. I'm in social services, so I'm not a good mathematician for that reason. Um, but it was it ended up to be about $235,000. But what was done with that money was it was specifically used to pay for certified peer specialists to become certified, go through the training, become employed and help other individuals with um, mental health disabilities. So the Certified Peer is such an awesome program because it helps individuals with mental illness become uh, professionals, but it also is helping them help others with mental illness. So it's a very, it's a giving profession. It's a, it's a really great program. That's one example of bridging funding. Um, another example is state agencies may pay for uh, mental health agencies may pay for the pre-vocational services and a post-vocational meaning once the case is closed by VR. So there's different models in that regard. One thing that is kind of a buzzword in buzzwords in the mental health system is called social determinants of health and also part of that is value-based purchasing. And social determinants of health, there are nine official ones, but I'll, I'll name the high ones, transportation, housing, um, food security, employment, domestic violence. Those are the big ones in regards to, you know, if systems can address these areas in individuals' lives, it's gonna help them be more independent and it's gonna help them lift them out of poverty. And value-based purchasing is part of that where um, managed care organizations in the mental health system are using that methodology to say, you know, we're gonna, if you can save money by helping an individual learn to be independent, as opposed to staying in their lane and um, these $10,000 worth of services are being purchased for them this year. If you can help them be successful so that next year they're more independent, we have to pay for less taxpayer dollar services, say $9,000, that's value-based purchasing. So um, what managed organizations and our partners are doing are helping to put individuals in those different lanes. They're not necessarily paying for those services, employment, being one of those, but they're putting individuals in those separate lanes so that they're putting them in a pathway of, have you thought about employment? What can you do? You know, can we assess you? You know, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses? What can we do to help you be more prepared for the world of work? So that's one um, component of what mental health is doing within the confines it has financially um, through its federal funding source to be able to kind of flip the script, change the narrative, as it were, to help individuals be more successful in their independence. Now, the Maryland model, I love this model. I wish that we could adopt it. What they did in the early 2000s was the DR and the, the MH agencies got a capacity grant, a couple million dollars, to be able to develop a common data system. So if an individual is coming to the mental health system for um, services, the as the input, the information is inputted into the application, it's simultaneously being filled in the VR application as well. 
and vice versa. If the person is coming to VR and they have a mental health diagnosis that's being filled into the mental health uh, uh, data system, if the person is not already um, in that system. So what it does is it speeds up the process. And, and I'm not knocking the VR system. I understand perfectly why the VR system has the process it does. But it puts everything that the VR counselor needs to know at their fingertips to say, you know, within 24 hours, I can determine eligibility for this person because I know the diagnosis. I know what that diagnosis means to their functioning. I know what I need to know to be able to say yes or no, this person is eligible for VR services. So it's really helped speed the process up. But they have rated funding down to a science where, again, the MH system is doing um, uh, pre-vocational services, they're actually doing some counseling while the person is receiving VR services as well, so simultaneous funding. And lastly, they're providing post-vocational once a person's out of VR services. Great model, suggest you look at it. And I'm just going to briefly list the Oregon model and the North Carolina model. Both of those took uh, waivers for the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, CMS for short. They, they created waivers that have employment services built in. The Oregon model has the home and community-based services waiver. So they're, they're using that much like a lot of ID agencies do to have employment as a uh, needed service. In North Carolina, they're using a waiver to show that they're saving uh, CMS dollars by using this methodology. So there's different models that you can use, but it takes a lot of effort and political will to get these models up and running um, but because of waivers. But there are different ways that mental health services, their mental health agencies can pay for uh, vocational services, but it's a circuitous long path, but um, check out those three different models and check out social determinants of health to get a better understanding of where mental health is in this realm. So next slide, please. Questions. So I think is that where so that's Beth, are we, are we given our high guess? Are we going to? Uh, um, yeah, there's Beth. <laughs> Hi, sorry, just took me a little second there to get that's my right. screen up. All right, yeah, we'll hop right into questions. We have quite a few here, um, and again, if we do not get to all of the questions uh, before we hit 12:30, um, we'll definitely follow up um, with Randy and Kimberly and. Um, Send those to you guys via email so you can get a chance to respond and we'll, we'll post those with the archive webinar. Uh, so the first question comes from Rose asking how do you find out about offerings for the adult mental health first aid training so interested folks can register and what is the cost for that training? Well I, I think it's something we can both work towards answering. I know in Pennsylvania it was a federal grant that the mental health agency had received and then we issued it out to our partners and um, Kimberly was fortunate enough to be able to, it was at no cost to her other than her uh, management team saying, you know, we will allow her to, to do it during her work time. Go ahead. Is she asking about to become an instructor or to attend the class? I missed that part. Uh, I believe attending the class. So it's um, mentalhealth.org. She can go on the website and they should have um, any classes posted. Um, my contact information, there's the resources and references and here's Randy and I's contact information. Um, she can reach out to me and I, and I can look to see if there's any upcoming dates. And if she could provide like where she's located, that would be helpful too. Well, it's virtual now, so it kind of really doesn't matter, okay. yeah. Yeah, I imagine lots of things that were location dependent are now virtual a little more yeah. uh, yeah. for that purpose. <laughs> All right, uh, next question from Amy asking, can you please clarify resources that offer psychoeducation different from family or mental health counseling? Is this like the National Alliance on Mental Illness? Uh, thank you. Well, psychoeducation, uh, it's intertwined between family um, supports and um, individual support. So it's something that's going to be, it's a component of the two. It needs to be added. So it isn't like something that's necessarily a separate tool, but it's something that's integrated into uh, any counseling that they may do. You know, helping a person understand uh, more about themselves, <clears throat> how the mental illness is adversely affecting them, 
you know, what it's doing to their, uh, you know, how, how they present to others in regards to um, when they are having these issues so that uh, they just gain a better understanding of themselves and their, their mental illness. The families gain a better understanding of their loved one and what the mental illness represents to them. So it's something that's, while it was listed as a separate um, circle in the larger circle, that's really something that's integrated into uh, any counseling that the individual receives. Um, the next one comes from Jody um, asking, what was the name of the treatment plan demonstrated by diagram? Um, this one came in earlier in your presentation. I think it might have been that circular diagram. I, and Jody, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we, you talk about the big circle, the, the circle of circles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I think. I believe so, but again, Jody, if I'm completely off base, please um, hop back into the Q&A and clarify for me. And same goes for everyone. If I misunderstand your question or um, you want to clarify, please feel free to jump back in. Well, the, the treatment plan, if I understand that question correctly, the treatment plan basically is dependent upon, it's driven by the individual. It's much like the IEP for school, the IPE for VR the ISP, the Individual Service Plan for <clears throat> Mental Health Case Management, it's going to be something that's unique to the individual, it's driven by the individual, and supported by professionals. So, it, you know, my treatment plan is going to be different than Kimberly's treatment plan, it's going to be different than uh, your treatment plan. So, it really is dependent upon the needs of the individual, and it's driven by the individual's desires. Um, and she did clarify, she was talking about the circle of circles. <laughs> okay. All right, um, next question comes from Angela asking, can you discuss services offered by OT providers in more detail? Well, in regards to, um, depending if the person has never worked before, depending on the person needs to habilitate, maybe the, you know, the, the mental illness has been detrimental enough, <clears throat> excuse me, that the person needs habilitation skills as opposed to rehabilitation skills, because they may never learned those skills in the first place. So the OT is uh, able to help them be able to be successful. Uh, a colleague of mine who is a, a PT and um, his wife is, is, is a uh, PT as well, helped me to kind of put things in perspective. He said that his wife uh, works with children and helps them with some OT. And I said, well, what exactly does that look like? He said, well, um, play is a, children's, is a child's work. So again, you know, helping the individual understand, you know, who are someone their age, what should be normal behaviors and normal activities that you should be doing so it helps them to mature. Because again, as I mentioned, it's first episode psychosis. So how is it helping the person? They may have never learned certain skills, you know, may have been trauma in the family, may have been, um, you know, the, the severity of the mental illness prior to medication, prior to therapy. So how can the person habilitate is what the OT person is, is what, what their role is. And I think too, the, to go along with that is like, if you have somebody with a mental health, that's exhausting. And I think that sometimes like, it's kind of that work hardening. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in getting somebody to the point that they can work for four hours right. at a time. So mm -hmm. that's where that OT comes into play is, is strengthening strengthening them to the, that they can get to that to that point. And, and as you notice, in that circle of circles, we'll call it that, um, the OT was right next to the supportive employment, supportive education. So again, it's something that isn't, um, isn't an isolated thing, but it's part of a larger team. So it isn't just, you have OT services and that's it, but it's for a purpose, as Kimberly mentioned, to help enhance the supportive employment skills. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next question um, was IPS, how is success in employment determined? Individuals maintain employment for minimum 90 days or is there a different criteria? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. In the IPS model, the agencies that are providing those services, they see their services as non-ending, meaning that yes, the year might pay for some of the services, but because the model is not something that's currently adopted or funded, in fact, they took it out of from WIA in 98 to WIOA 
in uh, 2014, they took uh, transitional employment out. So um, the IPS model is, is pretty much off the table in regards to what VR can fund. So in many cases, the IPS model is typically paid for by either the state through the different um, uh, models like I had shown, you know, through the waivers, <clears throat> not like Oregon or North Carolina has, for example, or in the case of Pennsylvania, it's paid for by the counties. Their block grant funds, their base, their base funds are paying for the long-term supports. So in many cases, VR isn't even part of the picture because um, the, the agency knows that, you know, VR is going to pay for a certain amount. It may take some time to determine eligibility. And what's nice about the um, having counties funding the IPS model is, you know, they already know the person has an mental, or excuse me, a mental uh, illness. They're able to hit the ground running and get the person in the services ASAP as soon as possible. Whereas, and again, I'm not knocking into your system. I understand perfectly. I was there in terms of the eligibility process, but it can take a very long time. So, um, for many, many uh, reasons, the IPS model has been kind of adopted by the county system because it's much more responsive to the needs of the individual. And the counties, because they're at a smaller level, local level, they can pay for things much more quickly and long-term. Because once a person's successful, you know, those touch points in a long-term support isn't that big. You may be two hours a month, you know, two hours a week, whatever just some touch points to make sure the person is being successful. Mm -hmm. um, our next question comes from Karen, and um, it looks like she's speaking specifically about the state of Rhode Island, but I would imagine this probably comes up in other states as well. Sure, sure. Um, what do you do when the mental health agencies say they don't have the staff and or time because they're doing case management as well, so they cannot provide supported employment services yet VR, VR cannot pr provide these funds. We cannot provide long-term funding. Only one mental health agency in the state of Rhode Island has the staffing ability. Well, I, 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 it sounds like they're talking about a provider of services as opposed to the state agency. So um, that was what I was thinking as we're talking. Kimberly, please feel free to jump in. Uh, I'm thinking that you need to talk to um, the, the providers, the, the um, service providers at, at the local level because they may have gotten grants, they may uh, have um, other funds that are uh, more flexible to be used. Um, like Google, for example, um, may, it, it, just off the top of my head, you know, nonprofit organization that has many sources of, of revenue. So in, in the case of Rhode Island, my suggestion is talking to that particular uh, provider that, that was mentioned and finding out, well, how do you fund this? And find out if there's ways that other organizations could replicate that. Because if there are capacity issues, right now, unfortunately, there are capacity issues across the board. So I think that, you know, until the pandemic is over, until we kind of dig ourselves out of that, this whole situation, unfortunately, I think we're going to have capacity issues. Um, but my recommendation is, is find out what that, uh, that agency is currently doing, the one that is doing it find out if it can be replicated and seeing if you, if you can get buy-in from other organizations to go that same course. Well, and as, as far as capacity issues go, like I, I think that that's just, it, it's everywhere. So don't feel bad that, it, right. that it's in Rhode Island. I mean, I've seen capacity issues here in Pennsylvania. So, so don't think that it's just you, it, it, it's all over. Um, but one of the things that I can suggest is it's, that collaboration it's it's all about communication so having that communication with your providers of like hey can you only handle 10 people so i know who i need to send here and it, it's a matter of having that communication knowing what each provider can handle so maybe one provider can only handle 10 people or another provider can handle 50 knowing those things and having that communication so that you're spreading the wealth if you will so that every you're you're not overwhelming so your, your provider that can only handle 10 you're sending them 50 people that doesn't make sense because then they're going to get backlog but it's a matter of you communicating but your provider also needs to be able to communicate with you and i think sometimes providers they don't want to tell us no as VR agencies because they're scared we won't give them any work. But at the same token, you need to have that communication. You need to have the, that open, honest dialogue in order to make things work. 
because we don't want to overwhelm them no more than they want to overwhelm us or to be able to say no. So yeah. just my two cents on that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I would imagine a lot of people feel overwhelmed for one reason or another right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, the next question comes from Marty. Um, will you be talking about, um, and this kind of came about the middle of your presentation, um, will you be talking about the specific challenges associated with mental illness? I am in a mental health clinic and I struggle with clients having issues with motivation, reliability, cognitive issues, sleep issues, etc. Sometimes it seems like I want them to work and be more financially secure more than they do. This makes it hard, hard to feel confident in their abilities. Well, and that's, I think that's a reality. Can we get it? Well, I was just going to say, yeah, I don't, I don't know that that's anything that you're doing wrong. That person needs to be in a right spot for employment. And it's the old saying, if you can lead a horse to a trough, but you can't make them drink. I mean, we may want somebody to be employed, but until they're, they're truly ready for that, I don't know that you can exactly force it. You can continue to encourage it continue to use the resources that the mental health field, have, you know, the agencies have, like they have the, the clubhouse model is really big on being able to teach them that skills and, and slowly introduce them into work. Because I think if you throw them into work, all you're going to do is set them up for failure. Well, and I think it's, it's from a fear-based perspective as well in regards to, well, I'm going to lose my benefits if I start working. So I think benefits counseling, if, you, yes. if that's not something you're already in, in your, your paradigm, in, in your, your wheelhouse, um, thinking about benefits counseling, getting that person into benefits counseling is, is going to be critical to help them understand that, you know, they can make more money and not lose their benefits. They can be more self-sufficient because they're making, making an income. So I think that that's part of the issue too. There's so many, um, uh, urban legends in regards to, oh, you're gonna lose your benefits as soon as you start working. So I think trying to undo that, that um, thinking is as important as anything else is having those conversations with people, find out where they're at in terms of their understanding and as possible, get them in front of a benefits counselor uh, to be able to help give them correct information. And it's also important that the families are aware of that as well. So uh, again, if they're a family, if you're aware of family peers that could be able to help have those conversations with the family, because the individual might be a minor and the family say, I don't want them to work. I know an example, a personal example of that situation happened where this young lady was unable to work because her mother didn't want her to. It turns out it was an income issue that, you know, if she were working and making income, possibly affect the benefits for the family and the, the income for the family goes down. So again, it's, it's as much disinformation as it is information. So uh, helping correct their thoughts is, is part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, with the answer that you two both gave, I mean, it also points out that there could be a variety of different ways to help different people. Not everybody's going to have the same types of hangups and might, you know, need different things to kind of give them over that hump and ready for work. Um, our next question comes from Emily. Any tips on how to support a client with their job during COVID-19? Uh, this is a work from home job for the client and their mental health is affecting their ability to succeed. It's hard to support this person from afar other than calls and encouraging texts. Self-care. That's the first, thing that, comes, yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind is self-care. If, if you can get them to write a self-care plan, I think is, 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 is huge. Um, they need to be able to take care of themselves because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't do what you need to be doing. Right. So I think it starts right there with, with them. So that's just my two cents on that. Well, and one of the things that we, we did at the state level, and I'm sure every state has done the same thing, is we push through telehealth and um, now certified peers, certified recovery specialists are doing things via telehealth. So again, the, the organic, the, the pure person coming alongside the person, it's able to be done by phone, it's able to be done by, by computer and whatnot. So uh, there are resources out there to help people despite the, the situation that yes, the landscape has changed. Yes, the, the, the way the service is being provided has changed, but there are those individuals that, that are still available despite the, the pandemic to be able to uh, come alongside that person, albeit virtually. 
to help them. So if your state has a certified peer specialist or your county is paying for a certified peer special, peers um, services, find out if that person could get plugged into that. Thank you. Um, and actually, I kind of want to um, I want to go back to an earlier question. Um, the question from Karen about Rhode Island. Um, okay. She chimed back in to kind of clarify a couple points for us. Um, okay. She said to clarify, this has been an issue for, for years. No community agency has the long term funds. So unless the mental health agency themselves provide the funds, the clients cannot get those services. Yet the mental health agencies say they don't have the staff to do so or the time because they're doing case management as well. We can provide a community agency supported employment funds, but only for 90 days. So the client then doesn't have any more support after the 90 days because the mental health agencies say they don't have the time or staff to do so. Well, again, and, and I, I don't mean to keep coming back to the certified peer. I'm not sure if Rhode Island has certified peers, but uh, I think that if do you have the availability for peers? It's a Medicaid billable service, so it's a federally funded service. Um, it might be a resource that can help individuals. Uh, it's not something that's really taken off the ground yet, but it's, it's kind of a pet project that I have where I think that certified peer specialists could be that long-term support uh, for individuals in regards to once the VR case is over. Uh, so find out, do a little homework and see if there are peers um, either in the county that you're in or uh, the state pays for certified peer specialists, or I should say, has gotten approval for Medicaid to pay for certified peer specialists. Um, I would recommend that that is probably a good resource, um, a touch point uh, to help that individual in this time to, to um, give them something to, during this pandemic, during the, the downtime of, of funding for everyone, uh, that would be my recommendation off the top of my head. You know, I'd love to talk more about that, dig deeper into the details, but that's my thinking off the top of my head in response to the second question, certified peer. Well, I was just thinking like if they don't, if Rhode Island doesn't have certified peer, like looking at some sort of natural supports, right. Um, and I think it would be a case by case basis. If your if your mental health agencies don't have the funding, is to look at those natural resources of you know helping that specific customer in that specific job to find those natural supports to be able to help them, um, whether it be a coworker or a supervisor that that can be that almost basically that peer support person, that natural mentor um, to be able to help them. And again, thanks, Karen, for jumping back in and clarifying. Yeah, I um, hope that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, I hope so as well. <laughs> All right, uh, next question comes from Adolfo asking, um, what is the trend concerning the SMI population? Do you think therapy is empowering individuals to function more without medication? What have you seen throughout the years? Is it clients having a higher intake of medication or clients making cognitive changes to take control of their lives? Which population did you say? Uh, SMI, SMI. Okay. Um, I, that, that's a tough question, and I, I don't mean to say I, I keep, I, you know, I don't think we can answer that, but I think it's, um, we realize now, and we'll talk more about this in the afternoon session, hint, hint, about like opioid, overuse of opioid, opioids and um, those types of medications, and just medication in general. I think that, um, medical doctors are just being forced, and in a good way, being forced to look at not over-medicating people. I think that our, our country has had gone up and up and up to the point of over-medicating. So I think that people are looking for alternatives to make sure that um, it's really truly meeting the needs of the individual. Instead of being the medical model, which is you know deal with the pain, reduce the pain, eliminate the pain, it's dealing with the person first. So. I don't have any data or statistics to say that, but I would like to think that it's going more towards person first. And again, I've seen an explosion with the use of certified peers. And I think that I keep coming back to that, but I had worked with the peer program when I was in VR for about 15 years. And I saw how beneficial it was and how it grew. And even just the other day, I was in a, um, our state planning council 
where individuals, you know, representatives from different agencies, individuals themselves with mental illness are talking to us and saying, this uh, executive director, this mental health agency, we're seeing this as a benefit, you know, as medications are reducing, the use of peers are going up and it's helping people. So I, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's the best I can give off the top of my head. Yeah, it's a it's a hard question to answer on the spot without being able to kind of look up the data. Um, well, we still have five or six minutes here, so we'll see if we can get through a couple more questions. Um, next, we'll one. try to be quick on the last few questions so we can try and get through them. <laughs> okay, we definitely won't get through them all, but we'll see how many we can get through here in these last few minutes. Um, Pamela asks, if you have someone with MI and health and some health disabilities. How can we help them with working when they don't have the physical strength, strength to do so? Is there somewhere for them to go while they are waiting to get their disability? Um, would this help with individuals with PTSD that aren't veterans? Yeah, that could be a possible, like looking at the SILs possibly, um, that, which is a center for independent living. Um, Just trying to think of some other resources. Like, and if it's a, if it's a mental health, they could be looking at the clubhouse model. Right, the clubhouse is is a, is a good model if it's in your state. Uh, maybe drop-in centers if there's not clubhouses in in your state. Drop-in centers could be good resources. Because um, again, uh, not knowing the specific situation, it's really hard to say. You know, this exactly is the, the best response. So. Again, it sounds like it's going to be a more of a mental health. If they're looking, waiting for disability to come through, it seems right. like it's going to be something that would be more in the mental health realm of things that they would be looking for because it doesn't sound like they're wanting to go to work, if I'm not mistaken. So I don't know that you would want to go the VR route necessarily, but just looking for those supports to help them during the day, like a drop-in center, a clubhouse, right. Right. a SIL, um, looking at some of those resources. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the next question, um, referencing back to your presentation, Nick asks, uh, can you please give the percentages of individuals in the prison systems again? So it was, let me look at my notes so that I don't tell you wrong. It was 64% in jail, which is county. It was 54% 54, 54 in the jails, which is, or uh, prisons, which is the states. And then it was 45% in federal. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, next question is from Teresa asking, are there any peer certifications for people with TBI? If so, can you please direct towards where to find such programs? Thanks. Um, I haven't heard of specific TBI. There are not, yeah, there are not peers for TBI, but there are clubhouses for TBI. There aren't many. There's one in Philadelphia, and I think there's one in Atlanta, Georgia, but uh, check out TBI clubhouses. Okay. Um, next one is from Annette asking, where can I find a certified peers slash recovery specialist in my state? Well, I would, um, if you're not already plugged in with your mental health agency, uh, either at the county level or the state level, depending on your, your, where you are as a professional, uh, I would start with the county level first, the county MH office, and find out, do they provide peer services? Or uh, they ask the case managers, uh, does the state provide certified peers? Or they could be called peer specialists, something like that, a recovery specialist. Um, a peer is kind of the, the common term as you go from state to state. So that would be where I would start first. If you have connections with the state system, the state agency, I reach out to the state mental health agency and ask them. Um, they may be able to provide a more complete response because the county may not know. Uh, and if the county is not participating and it's not something that the state is paying for, it could vary from county to county. So um, depending on where you're at, start with your county and then go to the state mental health systems. Um, and the next uh, post is actually um, somebody um, providing resources if other people want to check them out. So Martha posted um, the link for Wisconsin's model for certified peer specialists, just an FYI if anybody has questions about that. 
Um, so that's at uh, www.dhs.wisconsin.gov slash peer specialist. If anyone Thank would you. like to check that out. So yeah, thanks for sharing, Martha. Okay, um, so I think this will be our last question for today. It's um, a kind of a biggie. <laughs> um, <laughs> in uh, your opinion, how does racism impact mental health slash disability? Well, it's interesting. Um, this is a side note. I'm working with the Pennsylvania Association for uh, Persons Supporting Employment First, APSI. It's a national organization, but each state, many states have, have chapters. We're well, actually bringing in a gentleman who was incarcerated. He's African American. He was incarcerated for 19 years. And um, we're going to have him come and talk about that very topic and how it intersects with, with supported employment. And one of the things he was talking about, because again, you know, me being in my situation, I honestly don't, I haven't experienced those types of things. But just what he was sharing just kind of um, was kind of sent a chill down my spine in regards to, you know, walking home and whether, you know, sitting in your, your dining room, at your dining room table wondering if you're going to get shot. You know, those are some realities that many individuals are facing today. So um, it's something I need to get educated on. It's something that um, our APSI chapter definitely wants to get educated on. You know, how do we, how does the intersection of, of cultural uh, um, challenges, uh, racism, and supportive employment, how does it all fit together? So we're hoping to answer that question or at least pose the question and try to come up with some answers. So we can let you know when that um, uh, event is going to be taking place. I think it's September 18th. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I will see that the link for that event, and specifically his name is Colwyn Williams, C-O-L-W-I-N Williams from Philadelphia, PA. Um, he works with Temple University and his um, program, I'm thinking off the top of my head, is, is Stop the Hate, I think it's called, or End the Violence, one of those two. He has his own website. So, um, I think it's going to be a very powerful presentation. It's going to be eye-opening, and um, I suggest for that person who made that request, tune in. I'll provide the information after this presentation so that uh, it's something that they can look at attending. Thanks, Randy. And we'll make sure to share that link so people can check it out if they'd like to. Okay, um, so we've hit 12.30 here. Um, so again, if we didn't get to your question, we will pass it along to Kimberly and Randy so they can take a look and we'll post those with the archive webinar. Um, quick housekeeping thing before we go. Um, if you're in need of CRC for today's webcast, uh, visit Project E3's archive webcast series play page, click on the title of the webcast you've watched, and then under webcast and additional resources, click on evaluation survey. Uh, once you complete that survey, you'll receive your CRC credit, and it'll be emailed to you within a couple of minutes. Uh, but please be sure to check your spam or junk mail boxes, because sometimes those types of mailings can get um, shunted into, into those junk mail boxes. And just a, a bit of an add on to the end of that, uh, we do have some webinars coming up. They don't have registration numbers for them yet because we're still finalizing the details. Um, this coming uh, when or Thursday, next Thursday the 3rd, there is a break for Labor Day. Uh, we don't, many of our staff are, are taking time off uh, for the holiday. On 9-10 we'll resume with our um, our webinar series and what we'll be presenting on is a resource tour of uh, some of the Project E3, that's the grant that sponsors this series of webinars. We'll talk about some of the other resources that are available to folks on our website and within our communities of practice. There's a lot of really good research and tools available. Um, and then on the 17th, we'll be talking a little bit about webinars themselves. A lot of people since COVID have found themselves in a position where they need to either do training or they need to do some some sort of remote interaction. So um, our team here, uh, the knowledge translation team here at Stout Vocational Rehabilitation uh, would like to take some of our E3 webinar experience and share it with you so that um, you'll be able to use the, some of these platforms and um, and uh, 
have them be of service to you right now in this time where everybody's really kind of on a quick learning curve. Uh, but those are the trainings we have coming up. We do have another one that we're slating for 924, and that is a webinar about some of the other uh, things with E3 that we've discovered along the way that are resources that would help professionals uh, with their clients. And um, Beth, uh, there, there is going to be a little bit of a delay with getting CRCs. They're not immediate right now um, due to some scheduling issues. So um, it, it will probably take a couple of weeks for these particular CRCs um, to get processed for this morning's webinar and um, this afternoon's webinar. Um, but thank you so much, Kimberly and Randy. It was excellent having you today. It'll be great to have you this afternoon. Uh, Beth, I'll hand it back to you if you have anything else to add. Uh, no, nothing else. Thanks for clarifying on the CRCs. And please uh, join us this afternoon with uh, Randy and Kimberly again talking about veteran services. Thanks, so everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys.